Hello and welcome back to the Game Pit. I'm Sean, this is episode 107 and here's Ronan. Hello everybody, you're very welcome back to the Game Pit. Today, Sean, we've got a cornucopia of quick reviews for everyone. We have, Ronan. It's something that we've started to do around that sort of holiday period, around Christmas. We've got lots of birthdays going into January, so we do play a lot of lighter games, don't we? Yes, absolutely. Kind of Christmas gets extended by Nat's birthday, Ellie's birthday, Rachel's birthday. It turns into a whole couple of months, and there's always time off, and we're always looking to play games. And for me, that means playing with the kids and playing with the extended family. Uh, and obviously, my kids are now coming up 12 and 15, so slightly maybe older games, but all mostly casual gamers. So something that anyone really can pick up and play. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on on my nine games i'm gonna be talking about today with quick reviews sean it's slightly different for you yeah well obviously we've got james and he's five so we do like to involve him in the games and you can't really push them too far because they lose interest so it is there's a lot of actual children's games there's a few sort of family oriented games in there that definitely older people can play but a lot of them are pretty much directed at children so about maybe two thirds family games, a third younger children games today, I'd say. Yeah, that's about Something right. Something like that. So yeah, but we won't be going too deep into them. We're going to go through them quickly. So hopefully it's worth your time to have a listen through. And before we do crack on, Sean, we do want to mention one Kickstarter campaign. We were lucky enough to get sent a preview copy of Rambo, the board game, by Everything Epic Games. We've created a pit stop for it. So if you are interested in Rambo, please go along to YouTube or Board Game Geek and have a look at that. It's a co-op, sort of a mini tactical game, in which you take on different characters. They all act very differently, and you're going through missions, and you have campaigns of three linked missions, and your characters get slightly better gear and, and uh, equipment as you go through them if you're successful. It's up there now. If it sounds interesting to you, by all means, have a look at the pit stop, have a look at the campaign. It's running until the middle of February 2018, and uh, we had some fun with it, Sean, so it's one that we want to point everyone towards. Yeah, absolutely, and it's all already funded so it looks like it's going to be made so yeah get on if you if you were a rambo fan back in the, the 80s and or if you just fancy it i'm not sure i've ever seen a full rambo film i've seen them but a long time ago a long long time ago i think i was more into the commandos of the world but rambo is certainly something get to the chopper <laughs> bennett let off some steam Okay, this is right. going down here. Bad Arnie <laughs> accents, right? There. That's definitely a sign of movement. As always, we are very proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to download our episodes, we're on Stitcher, iTunes, and Podbean. And we have our YouTube channel where we do our pit stop videos, and we've got ambitions to do even more different types of videos there. So please go and check that out. do this Sean 18 games we'll kick off with Doodle Rush 2017 release about 10 minutes long if that three to six players designed by Adam Porter from Brain Games this is a drawing game in which each player is going to get two cards and there's going to be six words overall on those two cards then you flip a timer you've got 60 seconds to draw as many of those words as you can on your six little whiteboard placards after this is 60 seconds the timer flips again Everyone who's playing takes a look at the drawings in the current state they're in and they start trying to guess what the drawings are. And the person who's drawn it can tell you hotter or colder, but there's no turns. You're doing this all at once. They might be saying hotter or colder to your answer or to someone else's answer. If you guess one correctly, you get to take that picture back. After 60 seconds, you flip it over again. You have a second round of drawing the same words or changing them or finishing them. Another guess, another drawing round, another guess. So after six minutes minimum, this game is over. You're going to get one point for every correct guess by someone else. You're going to lose one point for every one of your drawings that no one's guessed. Doodle Rush, Sean. Yeah, Ronan, it's, it's another one of those drawing games. I always loved them. Going back to Pictionary, Pictomania, Fake Artist Goes to New York. I think there's a lot of scope to enjoy them is because people's drawing can be just on point or it can be absolutely terrible. The way people's minds work, especially under a time pressure, it can be absolutely hilarious. So, yeah, fully on board with Doodle Rush. 
Yeah, it sounds like trying to write this, do the six pictures in 60 seconds is going to be a massive rush. But the words, there's a simple deck and a harder deck, but they're all relatively simple. And I think the good thing about having the three drawing rounds is that can, you can react to people's guesses. So if they're guessing completely wrong, you just wipe it out and try and draw in a different way. Or if they're almost there, you can maybe add one or two things to give them a slight hint. But the whiteboards are very small, so you're not doing loads and loads of detail. It's very much about can you convey communication quickly. I had it down as sort of like a family pictomania, Sean, because I, I feel like you could play this with relatively young children, especially with the simple cards, like down to maybe seven or eight once they get fairly decent at drawing. Yeah, yeah, once they understand the words and I've got a mediocre sort of drawing skills then yeah, well, as good as us basically is what you're saying oh uh, yeah we never really progressed past five when it comes to drawing <laughs> not so much <laughs> i didn't do an art jesus he put it that way <laughs> i did i didn't do very well oh bless never mind moving on from the family shame doodle rush a very good family game i do recommend this a very quick and it's a game that I cannot get out and play once because everyone goes, oh, let's go again, let's go again, let's go again. Everyone's involved. There's no downtime. You're all having fun, but there's some structure to it. So a big recommendation for Doodle Rush for families. Sean, hit us. So, yeah, Ronan, my first game is going to be Foville, designed by Udo Pese, coming from Hook, and it's a two-to-four player game. Now, we discussed this one in one of our Treasure Hunts pre-Essen it kind of looks nice from a distance to me, but you definitely said it was a trap, and I can't quite remember if I said it was or it wasn't, but you definitely did. I'm sitting here with bated breath waiting for you to change my mind. Yeah, I think we both know that's not going to happen, is it, Ronan? Well, just try. <laughs> just try, okay. So, what's the game about? It's all about a, a town in which there's a, a grumpy old dragon sitting just outside the town, and every now and again he's going to attack the town. Now, what you do is you roll dice, and you influence six characters, and they're all going to help you to build your town and to do various things. There's like a travelling mischief maker who lets you gamble with the dice, and there's a town planner that allows you to bring pieces of your town in. Now, every now and again that dragon, as I said, is going to attack the town if you roll doubles with the dice. The damage he can do corresponds directly to how many clouds you've got about for your town. What happens in the game, Ronan, is it's it's so simple because you've only got those six characters. You've got the randomness of the dice and the randomness of the stuff that you can actually pick up from the board. And it really becomes monotonous very quickly. You're just doing the same thing over and over. And sometimes I mentioned that sort of traveling mischief make because that's the only interesting thing you can do towards the end. You're thinking, I've done, I made my town, I've got enough clouds, I've got my set collection for the various things in the town, and I just want to do something interesting now. And even that's a bit boring. <laughs> So oh dear. Oh dear. the game really feels to me that it's aimed at like super new gamers. Then you feel like it's a gateway. It almost feels like it's like people who've never even really played games at all. It even goes to great lengths, as we talked about in our S and preview, to even explain what a double is on a dice. It just feels really too simple and too I think it doesn't give people enough credit, in my opinion. It's a funny thing with games that come out, especially from companies like Hook, in that they are aiming at the German family gaming market. And in Germany, basically, it's a huge population that's game literate from a very young age. And sometimes it feels like a very strange bit of pitching to us, whereby it's very simple, but it's got gamely elements. And we look at it and say, well, our kids won't get that but there's not enough there for someone older who'll get all these gamely elements. And so sometimes the games just miss you an intended audience away from that German game literate population. Do you think that's what's happened with Feuerwehr or is it worse than that? I don't think it's worse than that. Yeah, I think there's probably, you've hit the nail on the head. I think they just have not quite hit that nail and they haven't gone for one or the other. They've kind of landed bang in the middle. So I just don't see the audience for this game and from what i can see on board game geek and things like that people aren't that interested in it the idea behind it was very clever the story was a bit weird with the clouds and everything and yeah it just didn't quite hit the meat of a good game and that was foville from hook 
Okay, this next one is Matterhorn. 2017 game, takes about 20 minutes for two to four players, designed by Leo Colovini, who is a very storied designer, and from Helvet Deep. Matterhorn is themed around mountaineering, climbing up the Matterhorn peak itself in the Alps. Each player gets two climbers in their colour, and you're racing to get both your climbers up a board, which starts with a wide row of 12, and then you go 11, 10, 9, 8, all the way up to 5s, and then you're out. On your turn, you roll five dice to start with. Any dice that duplicate each other, they are doubles, triples, quadruples, whatever they are, do not count for your total this turn. Any remaining singles, you check them, and you see if they correspond to one of the numbers between 5 to 12. You may remove one die from play at this time, one of those singles, though, not anything that's in a double, if you need to adjust that number. And then you put an obstacle token, face up, it's currently an action token, on the number row that you've created with your dice. And then pick the dice up, apart from any that you've removed previously, and you choose whether to take your actions you've saved or roll again. When you're placing action tokens, they cannot go on a line that you've previously used. So if I've used seven, I cannot go on seven again. If I roll and I cannot legally place my token, I've rolled too low, too high, or the only numbers I can do have already got my tokens on, I bust. All my action tokens flip over and they become obstacles in the way of this pyramid to prevent climbers climbing through. If I choose to stop at any point, and I, I will have to have at least one face-up action disc on there, I can take actions equal to the number of discs I've placed, and they all flip over and become obstacles, and then I can move my own climbers in any direction, move someone else's climbers up or sideways, probably to get them out of my way, or I can remove one obstacle from anywhere on the board. If a row ever completely fills with obstacles and climbers, then that's going to wipe, it's going to open up again. If you place an action token on a row that contains a climber, you get a bonus action immediately, and even if you bust, you at least had that bonus action and you're racing to be the first to get these two climbers all the way up the Matterhorn Sean we played this together very recently a push your luck dice game must in some way I'd say be inspired by can't stop but different to that game for sure any thoughts it was a strange experience Roland I, I, I kind of enjoyed it but I don't really see any great amount of skill in the game because I found that when you did roll the right dice and you could put your tokens onto the board, it was fairly easy to decide for where you wanted to, who you wanted to stop and what was the optimum place to stop them, especially as, as they go further up the mountain. And if you don't roll the dice, then there's not a lot you can do. And there's been games you've told me in the past where you didn't move off the bottom of the mountain because you just kept rolling doubles all the time. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange one. It was a it was a funnish experience, but I wouldn't put any stock in anyone who says they're a Matterhorn champion player. Wow. Have we got you on the, come out the wrong side of the bed today? <laughs> I, as I said, I had fun playing it. I just found it complete random fun rather than any real... That is involved. harsher than I had imagined. <laughs> this is a... A holiday game episode, Sean. We're looking for fun. We're not looking for deep strategy. I'd say it's fun. I like playing it. I know what I'm getting. I'm getting a game where it's pretty funny. Something's going to happen. You're going to block people. You have to play with people who are okay to being blocked. I, I said to you, did you think James would enjoy it? And you thought it might be too nasty for younger children like that, as young as him, possibly need to be a bit older and find a bit more of the humour in blocking each other and, and not be too worried about it. The one problem I thought you kind of touched on it there. You can bust a lot and end up with very few moves. That could be a problem, especially if you're playing with four players. But it is very quick. It only lasts 20 minutes and turns go around very quickly. As long as people are relatively quick at adding together their dice and everyone's going to shout at you what your options are anyway. There's no doubt yeah. about that. T tell me you've got a heart today, Sean. Tell me you were no. seeing that. It, well, you're playing with non-gamers. And I mean, actually non-gamers. And they say, oh, yeah, I'll try something. You can't get something that's longer than half an hour because then they're, they're not going to want to play it. And you can't have anything that's too skillful because they're going to get whooped. This, to me, was actually a decent option. Yeah, you know, it probably is. Um, I think my issue with it is that it got a little bit of buzz out of Essen and I was expecting a bit more. So I think I came in expecting something that really wasn't there. And what I found was, as you said, a very light game that you can just bust out at any time with non-gamers. Yeah, so yeah, it is perfect for that. And as I said, I did have fun playing it. I think this should be the reviewer's code. Review the game, not your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> but your expectations play a big part. 
they do. There's no doubt about that. I think we're chatting about it in episode 100 about that. There's, there's questions come in. And by the way, everyone, episode 100 is coming very soon. There is still time to get questions in. So tweet us, email us. If you want us to discuss anything, a game, something we've talked about, a review, anything you like, the game podcast at gmail.com. To finish up on Matterhorn, for kids eight and over, for non-gamers, it's good fun. It's quick. It goes quickly. Everyone's laughing. Someone's going to be misfortunate. Someone's going to get blocked. If you can take that sort of fun, the Matterhorn is a decent, fun little game. Okay. Talking about quick, I'm going to talk about Karuba Jr. Coming from Rudiger Dawn and Tim Rogach and Haber Games. It plays one to four players. And having played Karuba with you, Ronan... Yeah, it's got the very, very faintest resemblance, really. You are building a path around to things, so that's about it. In Kruber Jr., the pirates are set out to sea, and you start on a beach with your three characters, and basically you've got to draw tiles randomly and try and build a path to three treasures that are going to be also drawn. But should you ever draw the pirate ships, they're going to get closer and closer. If the pirates ever land on the beach, you lose if you haven't got all your three people to the treasure. Now, it's really simple. You are drawing just blind tiles. There's no skill to it other than you're just not boxing yourself in and making sure that you've got paths out to put the treasure should they turn up. There are also tigers as well that block paths. Not really nothing to this one. I think there's a bit of excitement in the, like, when the pirates are getting close, when you're drawing those tiles. But, Ronan, this one really does play in five minutes and no more. It is over in a flash. And for that reason, I enjoy it. I think it's nice that kids have got a choice for co-op game, Sean, because I think thinking about when my kids were younger, really we played Forbidden Island, and I can't think of too many other co-ops they wanted to play, but a lot of them do seem to be super simple, and co-op almost, I mean, I've I've played a couple of them with, with mates, kids, and, and family kids and stuff like that. They almost seem to be a, a replacement for lack of choices. A lot of them tend to be very, very random. So we all win together or we lose together. Uh, and Karuba Jr., to me, I'm, I'm getting that kind of a feeling. So I was going to ask you, it's a four-plus recommended age. Was it any good for older children? But it seems to me like you're telling me no. No, absolutely no, Roden. The, the reason it's fun for us is because it's fun for James. And we can see him enjoying it. And we do, like, when you're turning over a tile, it's, whoa. And then we do the pirate voices. If it's a pirate and James moves the ship. and we That sounds of... like it's more for you than him, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> or maybe, maybe. But I think we give the game more than there's there already. We kind of build it up and build up the tension for James. There's nothing else there. It's, it's really super light. I'm getting kind of excited myself here. <laughs> so we got Karuba again. My kids are older. How far do you think James is away from able to play Karuba itself? I think maybe another year or so, maybe a year or two. He's certainly building up a lot of gaming skills with the various things that we introduced to him. So I think he's he's on the right path. Oh, path. And hey. Hey. so I think, to yeah, the maybe. To the temple of Karuba. <laughs> to the temple. I think, yeah, Shocking. maybe maybe when he's sort of six, six and a half, that kind of age. Beautiful. All right. I'm going to go to something that's definitely much more of a gamer's game. It's a card game called Iliad Heroes of Troy. Officially a 2016 release, but I kickstarted it and, and I got mine in 2017. So I think it's really a 2017 release. Whatever, unless I missed the first Kickstarter. It's 30 minutes long for two to four players, designed by Angelo Nicolau and from Escape Velocity Games. So Iliad is a game in which there's a deck of cards and each of the cards is of one of three factions, the Greeks, the Trojans or the Gods. They also have a set of three out of eight traits available in the game. Each player gets a hand of cards, there's a start card, and then you play a card on top of wherever the start card was. Whichever faction that card belongs to, and it's not necessarily the person who played it because you get a hand of random cards, are going to score points for every match between the utmost card and the card below it. So that is a faction and the three different traits, a maximum of four points. Then whoever played the card is going to get to activate one of the traits, 
And that's going to allow them to steal cards from other players, steal points from other players, draw cards, swap cards around in their hands, play a second card but not activate its power, and generally mess slightly with the very simple situation of play a card from your hand, whoever is of the faction that card scores points. Whenever one player runs out of cards, that's the end of the game, and whoever scored the most points by the end of it is going to win. The pull of this being called Iliad, Sean, and the fact that it's got really, what I think is fantastic artwork, is kind of what pulled me in. It's from uh, the same Kickstarters who did Omen and stuff like that. So again, I was pulled. As I play it, the first thing I say is zero theme. Yeah, Roland, that was my first question. (laughs) I was going to ask you, so how much of the theme of this game actually comes through? Do you feel like a Spartan or or any of the other factions? Some of the traits feel a little bit like they are like you have charisma which which lets you get cards but someone else gets cards or you can be a warrior which lets you bully and take points of someone else like that and they've tried to ally the characters to their powers so if achilles is obviously going to have a warrior trait or uh, agamemnon's going to have the king trait and things like that zeus is a king and what have you and pious so there's a little bit that but but you're really pushing to it and do I feel like I'm one of the factions taking part in the Greek Trojan Wars? No, I do not. I haven't played this one with you, Roland, um, but I've got to say that I completely agree with you with the art. I've just been looking at it now, actually, and it's absolutely stunning. It's really, really lovely art. It looks fantastic, and it helps. I think it does help. I think, although it doesn't feel like I'm playing it, it does at least tie it together and gives it some sort of framework. Yeah, and my last question for you, Ronan, is does this one really fit into the family gaming episode? There's a little bit more going on here. It seems like it can be a bit mean to each other, etc. I think being mean to each other doesn't necessarily mean not a family game. I think actually kids and that quite like being mean. It's very gentle meanness, and it's always targeted meanness. In that, all right, you've got 12 points, we've got eight, so I'm going to steal two points from you. And it, it always makes sense. You go, yeah, okay, that does make sense. It plays very fast. It's got hand management in there, but it's very simple hand management, as in, I've got these two cards that aren't my faction. That's not good for me. I'm going to draw two other cards. If they're off my faction, that is good for me. It's, at one level, very simple to play, because you're just looking to match your own faction somehow. Once you start thinking more about the powers, it feels like there's a bit more there. But after a few plays, I'm like, no, there's not that much. It is actually quite a simple game that has an illusion of more thought to it. It's got a little bit that there's two cards, the Trojan Horse and the Favour of the Gods. There's a little bit of hidden scoring as well. And you can never play those cards or get rid of them. They can only be stolen from you. And one is minus two points, one's plus two points. And once you realise that one of those is in someone's hand, because there's a power that lets you look at someone's entire hand and draw a card, you go, oh, wow, they've got the Trojan Horse. I better not go near them again. And then the other person might say, why are you never drawing from them? Oh, they've got the Trojan Horse. Little gamely bits like that into a light, quick framework. I'll say... Iliad claims to be a two to four player game. It is just a three player game. I understand why you wouldn't market it like that because it limits your audience, but it is strictly a three player game to work properly. I enjoyed it, but I did play it with gamers. When I played it with non gamers, there was a bit more non plusness going on. So there you go. If you want a quick filler, have a look at Iliad Heroes of Troy and enjoy the wonderful art and the quick gameplay. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Haber for another very light children's game. It's Monza, designed by Jürgen P. Grunau, and playing two to six players. In Monza, you've basically got a, a track. It's a car race from the famous race track, and all the sections are of different colours, and you have dice that match those colours. You're going to ro- roll a big bunch of dice and try and plan out as best you can to get your car the furthest along the track so it's very simple in front maybe adults to sort of work out that but when my boy first started playing it Roland it wasn't quite that way yeah this is sort of classic Haber it's got a big reputation when you say to people what's the best Haber game especially young people game Monza comes up again and again and again it came out in 2000 and I have actually never played it which is a bit odd I can see where the difficulty will be for kids because it's actually quite a lot of maths to work out, that whole fish for the dice, where you go, if I use the blue now, that's plus three. Then I use a red, that's plus three. And then the yellow is plus two. But if I use the red now, it's plus one. Yellow plus one, blue. You know, to work out that difference, 
I can see that initially that's going to be very challenging. Did James grow into it? Did is he starting to solve the puzzle more efficiently? Yeah, at first it was kind of he would just if he, there was a red in front of him and he saw a red dice, he'd say, oh, "I'll play red," and he'd just start lining up, and then he'd get to a point where maybe he'd play three out of the seven dice or six dice, and he'd stop and he and we'd take him back. He's all right. We we track, go back. See now, if you played your blue first. And you saved your red to late because you can see if you can play your blue, then your yellow, then your green, and then there's another red, and you can use your red there, and you can go even further, and you, and the red bridges to another color you've got. And he was like, "Oh, okay." So about I would say maybe the fourth or the fifth game, he started doing that himself. He started laying out the dice, and then all of a sudden he was like, "No, no, no, no!" If I go back and I go blue, green, red. Then I can play my yellow, and then look, I've got another green, and I can go even further. And now he's an absolute demon at it. <laughs> well, that's good, I guess. He's, he's a shark. Your games very soon. <laughs> that's that's great. That's something you really want to see from kids: is that progression and them learning and the ability to plan and think ahead. Is it fun for yourself to play, or is it fun because James likes it? I think more so than Karuba Jr., I think this one is definitely more fun for myself and Natalie. I think we do have a bit of fun. You, you do get bad rolls of the dice, and there are areas that are blocked, and you can only get like a green or a red that will get you through, and or some that are even worse than that. It's only one color. They've blocked either side of the three-lane track. So it's one color will get you through, and rolling to get through those is sometimes quite funny. And yeah, everyone gets bad rolls and good rolls of dice and we do the meow sound as we're moving and when we come to a halt it's the uh. the presentation sean i only looked at pictures of bg is it a little bit dated in presentation or not i think it's almost got, got the retro feel to it a little wooden cars with a little circle on top to pretend it's the driver's helmet and yeah it's kind of got almost a retro feel and i think it's almost back in fashion so yeah i quite like it i think it's quite cute so thumbs up all around for Monza. Yeah, Monza's a definite thumbs up. We do enjoy that one. It deserves being on all those geek lists. Okay. <laughs> My next game is Docmus, a 2016 release, 40 minutes, two to four players, designed by Miko Punacalio, published by Lotta Pellet, and just announced from Renegade Game Studios. Docmus is the story of an island, which is made up of eight tiles, which are put into a nine-tile grid with one gap, which is going to move around the place. There are squares on those tiles, and most of the squares represent different terrain. There's grassland, there's, there's forests that are diff more difficult to move through, there's lakes that you can sail across, there's mountains that are impassable, there's volcanoes you can go on for one turn to bridge across. There are ruins that will trigger powers, and there are temples. And temples are the key to scoring, because you're attempting to get as many of your pieces next to as many temples as possible across the eight tiles in the game. On a player's turn, they're going to play three of their pieces and they must always bridge off one of the pieces they've previously played. The key to it is that there are five gods in the game. And there is a god power draft at the beginning and you're going to choose what your special power is going to be. Now, there's one of them that just lets you go first and that's it. So you know no one's going to mess with the board or with your pieces before you start playing. There's other ones that will let you move a tile, which means that that gap is going to shift and could go anywhere around the nine tile grid. There's the ones that let you rotate a tile, which will take someone else away from the edge of one that they can't get across or put your piece in place to bridge across to another tile. There's things that let you move one of your pieces before you move in. And then the last one that will go fifth in the turn will let you do any of the previous powers but you go last, but you get to see what everyone else has done and you can react to it suitably. Once you've gone through eight rounds of this, playing out your three places, everyone's going to score for each temple they're next to. There are large and small temples, large ones score you most points. For sort of being next to all the temples on a tile to score you bonuses, the number of different tiles that you're on is going to score you bonuses. And it's all done in 40 minutes in a very abstract puzzle, Sean. That's Docmus. So this one I've had actually called for quite a long time, Ronan. And I picked it up thinking, I knew it was fairly abstract, but I thought there was going to be a bit of theme involved in there. Then I found out that it was going to be quite an abstract game. And despite all the, the good buzz, there we go back to expectations again, coming out of Essen and people giving it good reviews. I got a bit frightened by it and it looked a bit complicated. Now you're putting it into a family show where we're talking about family games. I'm back to be more interested in it, Rona. It's certainly not 
complicated in terms of the rules. There's a little bit of thinking about being able to slide across lakes and being next to a temple makes you adjacent to everything the temple's adjacent to. That's the only little tweak in the rules that's difficult. The god powers all make sense. They're all very easy. The planning, that is much more difficult because it's completely a puzzle, but it's a puzzle that's got chaos and the chaos is the other players. And the fact they completely can change the board around or change where your pieces are in relation to all the other things that are in play. The ability to plan amongst chaos, I think, Sean, that gives it depth. And there's definitely levels at which you can play Docmus. It can be played very casually and very nicely. And all I'm doing with my powers is setting myself up to score more points. And then you can play with people like Lloyd or maybe me. And we'll be using our powers to help stitch you up and send you off into the middle of nowhere and leave you with 24 pieces all in one corner and you'll be crying. But I wouldn't do that playing with family. And that's one of the good yes, things. Yes, you would. Uh, depends who the family member was. You, yes. <laughs> so one of the things about Doctors is it has got that. There's this thinking there for gamers. There's simple, interesting gameplay for family. The hard sell bit, I'd say, for family here is... It's dry as a bone. I cannot begin to tell you who you are, what you're doing, and why you're doing it, and how the mechanisms fit into any sort of a theme. Hi, uh, Ronan, you're losing me again. You're losing me. <laughs> pull me back. Pull me back. <laughs> okay, how will I pull you back? Um, it's a hard sell. It's interesting. You have to be able to think on your feet because everything is going to change and shift. It's a very tactical game. You have to be willing to sacrifice better turns, sometimes to go earlier in turn order, just to set yourself up for the next turn, if you want to play well, that is. More casual gamers have got to get their head around the end game scoring bit, because you can score lots of bonuses for being on all the different tiles, for being six, seven, eight tiles will get you lots of points. It's hard to do, because you start in a corner. And you're going to have to rotate and move and spin and sugar around and be on corners and jump onto two at a time as you can in order to get that bonuses. So if you are a gamer, you're going to kill your family members if you play properly. So you said that a game before Foible sits between two sort of stools. I feel that a little bit with Docmus. It's dry and it's abstract, but it's also chaotic and very tactical. And if that Venn diagram meets and you're in that centre section go for it. I'm not sure there's a huge audience for it. Okay, lovely, lovely. I think I'll give it a go, Rona. I'll give it a go. It doesn't take long. Why not? Fair enough. Okay, so my next game is called The Enchanted Tower. Whoop, 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 whoop. Whoop, and it's the first <laughs> This is of... a family favourite, Sean. Yeah. Let's just spoil this right now. This is a family favourite. And it's the first of our games in this episode by the brands, Inca and Marcus. It comes from Dre Magia Spiel and plays two to four players. So very quickly, in this game, one of you is the evil wizard and one of you is the hero. There's a princess locked in a a castle. Okay, so the box is placed on the table. The the board itself is placed into the box. And there are holes in the box in which you can place a key underneath tiles where you're going to cover up the holes with with these tiles. So only the wizard knows where the key is because they place it while everyone else closes their eyes. So the trick is everybody's got to roll dice and try to find find the key so the wizard knows where it is so what you have in here is bits of bluffing etc going on and the person who finds the key gets to place it in one of the keyholes on the enchanted tower they get the right one the princess pops up in the air and that person is either rescued or recaptured depending on who it is the princess that's the enchanted tower road and you've already given given it all away it's a favorite it's a favorite from my girls for years they've they're slightly outgrown it now but they absolutely love it but there's reasons why they love it one of them i think is that there's the one versus many aspect a team control robin as he goes around looking for the key and one person controls the evil wizard and that team aspect the kids just absolutely loved it and they love chatting and they love like people got a turn to be you're in charge this turn you're in charge of them but other people can put input and the fact that they could have different opinions that someone had to work it out and obviously whoever was playing the wizard would really ham it up 
and play the role and, and, and mock you for the going the wrong way, whether you're going the right way or the wrong way or not. And it became a sort of little story, a little role play every time we played the game. Yeah, James loves being the wizard. He loves he loves the, the fact that he knows something that you don't. And he's uh, again, we talk about the journey in games. He started off and he'd just dart straight for the key. So be like, okay, well, we're closer. If we get a better roll than you, we know where the key is now. But now he goes off on little winding routes, leads us down paths, and it's that bluffing and sort of deduction side of it that we really love. Teaching your children how to be deceived. I know, right? I know. One of the Shock. joys of gaming. But that secrecy thing, it, it works both ways. And that is, as you like to say, the theatre of the game. Ooh. You don't know. Every step Robin takes, because there's a magnet on the bottom of the thing. Yeah, and when you step it. on the right thing, there's a dink. And the key actually dinks up. And then when you find the key, there's six different holes you can put it in. And only one of them will save the princess. So even if you find it once, it doesn't mean you've won the game. And the whole secret, you have every step, you might find the key. And then when you have found it, is, are we going to put it in the right one or the wrong one? And if you die, oh, no, we're going to start again. It's It's got tension at every, literally, step of the game. Light, gentle tension, but it really works. It's, it's the right level for kids to, to really get involved in. 100%, 100%. And that physical theatre of the princess actually popping up. Yeah, yeah. It's ah. Cheers. Cheers when that happens. <laughs> yeah, the amount of times that James has done that on his first go. It's like, incredible. Like, because think... you pick the tower up and you can just spin it. It could be any of the six. <laughs> There's no way of knowing which of the six. There's no marks or anything. I think it's and... this one. Think. Oh, for the love of God. <laughs> They're all witches. All of them. It's a brilliant kids' game for ages five to ten, in my opinion, Sean. Your thoughts? I think it's one of the best kids games i've ever played and james loved it we've got the travel version now in a little tin and it still works just as well very ingenious how they got the tower to work really cool i love it and that's the enchanted tower i'm cheating for this one sean it's the last game of this first half and it is a game but it's <laughs> not a game <laughs> so, it's an app now, I'm going to shoehorn this in because it is very reminiscent of a card game that you play on the tabletop. And lots of people play apps out during their holidays. You're by yourself, you're traveling or whatever. So this is Age of Rivals. I believe it came out in 2017. It's by Roboto Games, and it has got a design. It's VJ Mineni. And it's a two-player game where you can play online against other people or pass and play or offline against a bot. It is a card game in which you're building up a civilization, and there are hundreds of cards in the game. But you start off with a limited deck, and just by playing, you by, by winning certain things or by playing in certain ways, you, you earn more cards into your deck and you have more variety. But anyway, there's plenty of variety to start with. You initially are drafting cards, and each player in effect gets a hand of four cards, and you can see what they are, and they have a cost in money. You start with an initial budget. And you draft one, you put it into play on your tableau, it's going to be eight cards for each round. And then the other player, you swap hands and you draft a card and the other four cards that have been taken get thrown away. And you do it four times, you end up with eight cards. And the cards come, there is resource cards, which will make other cards cheaper. And in fact, if you have a resource and the other player tries to build a card that doesn't have that resource, they have to pay you some money so you can tax each other and you can do some stuff with resources. There are units that are going to be attacking in two different ways and defending. There are buildings you can build which might help your units, help your income, provide money at the end. There are like culture cards you can build which usually generate uh, many more points but are vulnerable and there's all sorts of synergies between different cards to learn in the game you decide what direction you go in once everyone has drafted their eight cards you have a thing where you go out and you attack these cities which are just points that are available and whoever's got the most strongest unit so if i had four weak units but you only had two sean because i had the most units i would start attacking the cities and get points for doing that the problem would then come that you attack each other's cards and I would attack you with my weakness, you'd attack me with your strongest, and I would assign the damage somewhere, but I have to soak up all the damage. So if you attack me with one unit that does eight damage and I assign it to a two building, I would still have more damage than assigned to more buildings, and you're knocking my cards out of consideration for scoring for this round. As well as doing that, 
my cards come back healed but not fully healthy and one gets turned into rubble those eight cards in effect or that's on the app get shuffled up four of them will form the basis of my next hand for round two so as i get cards knocked out they may or may not come out again you're weak in my deck for the rest of the game and then we get to the fourth round all the cards i've drafted get shuffled up and we do our eight again and you're building up this economy of hopefully synergies within your own little deck that you're building out of a larger pool of cards and the more you play the app the larger that pool of cards becomes the more wild and varied things you can do you before the game you start to be able to dictate which cards will be in the larger pool that you can be able to draft from which also your opponent can you can see what cards will be in the draft there's a lot of depth going on and where they've hooked me on age of rival sean is that i love card games with synergies where i can do different things and i love drafting games and this is an app that does both very well yeah wow it's you just kept going i was like and it does that and it does that and it's like okay there's a lot of depth in there in, in that app Roland. there's quite a lot I could see it being a little bit overwhelming it's got a rating of 4.8 out of 5 at the moment on i'm on android we did get a code for this by the way so i didn't pay the couple of quid for it so maybe that's why i'm such a big fan of it but i'd like to think i'm a little bit deeper than that but not much it's a 4.8 out of 5 rating sean on, on the star so i thought it would be too complicated and i thought it might struggle to find an audience but it's finding it out there there's a really good tutorial that sort of eases you in and the fact that the pool of cards you're using is limited to begin with i think is a very clever idea because you're seeing the same resource cards you're seeing the same units over a few games and you start to get a bit of a hold of it before it starts throwing more and more cards at you it's quite cleverly done Ronan, what what i'm thinking here is that I'd like to see a physical copy of this game. I'd like to be able to play this physically on a table, watch my opponent, that kind of thing. So it sounds like it would make a fantastic physical card game. It sounds good as it is, but I think it'd be made better. Yeah, I'm not the biggest player of apps at all, and I don't really like board game apps either. I, I definitely miss that social interaction part, and that thing you're saying of seeing your opponent react and reacting to them. I would love there to be a physical version of this for the full game it would be a big game it it would be a big investment but i I think any publishers listening this is it's worth looking at age of rivals because just the fact it doesn't exist physically it is a physical card game that happens to be digital and uh, there's a lot to it There's, there's hundreds and hundreds of games in this sean to discover it all so age of rivals is a thumbs up from me that will finish off our first half of this episode if you join us for the second half and we'd love you to you're going to hear quick reviews of nine more games we'll see you in a sec okay we're back for part two of this episode and we're going to start with a bit of madness ronan it is. It comes in the form of a Go Town, designed by Morton and Alexander Bonavent, and it's from Helvetique. And it plays two to four players. Quite simply, in Go Town, you're going to get dealt a hand of cards. On your turn, you're going to pick up a card, and you're going to try and put the numbered cards together to make nine and that is going to make floors of a building all sounds really simple so you're trying to get to five floors the madness comes in is there is absolutely loads of cards that mess this up you have you have donut cards which makes everyone miss a turn because they're having a break obviously they're having donuts you have swinging crushing balls that will crush out came in like a wrecking ball yes nice and (laughs) they will take out the top floor of your building you have drills that will take out the top floor of your building if they're not guarded already by a dog but if you also happen to have a bone that can lead the dog away then you can drill someone's building absolute insanity going on Ronan but we had a lot of fun and there was a lot of laughing and I really enjoyed my play of Go Town what do you think? I can't believe you didn't milk- mention that my milkshake brings all the boys to the yard <laughs> oh yeah random you get chucked someone a milkshake they miss a turn <laughs> they're drinking their milkshake what's wrong with you they can't put seven and two together they're having a milkshake 
Well, I've I've got a question for you, Sean. It comes in as a three word question. Ridiculous or genius? I think equal measures of both. A little bit of column A, a little yeah, bit of column B. Yeah. <laughs> it's quick, it's funny, it's odd. I'll be honest with you, after I learned the rules, I was like, What there's nothing to this. What is this game? <laughs> I'm going to call it an unexpected hit. <laughs> it was very funny for all the wrong reasons and some of the right ones. And it was a really good play and I enjoyed it and I'll get it out again. Somehow, by doing all the wrong things, they've, they've made a game that's a lot of fun in Town. They really have. It just was a lot of fun. I was, it was a game you sort of made me stay back. I had a long drive ahead of me when we were having our game day and it was like, I really don't want to play another game. You were like, stay and play this one. And I, I laughed for the, what, 10 minutes that it took to play. And it thoroughly... might have been hysteria. <laughs> it may have been, it may have been. But, yeah, it was It was just funny. You don't really care if someone knocks down sort of your fourth story of the building as you're just about to put down the fifth one because it's just funny. And someone lobs you a milkshake, you're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sad I'm missing a go. I'm quite happy I've got a milkshake. Yeah. <laughs> it just takes the edge off. Okay. Let's Sorry move on that. to a different card game, shall we, Sean? Yes, this is that. Claim, a 2017 game for two players, 25 minutes long, designed by Scott Alms from White Goblin. Claim is a two-player trick-taker. Now, I hadn't heard of none of them until last year. Fox in the Forest came out, which I haven't played, but Claim also came out, and I have played this one. It's split into two halves, and in the first half, although you get handed a deck of cards... You're going to use that deck of cards to build a deck of cards for the second half, which is when you're actually going to be able to score the vast majority of your points. And the way you do that is that there are cards from zero to nine in five different suits. A card gets flipped over in the middle. You know that that's the card you're playing for. And it might be good or it might be bad. So you might want it or you might not. You're going to play a card from your hand. And the other person must follow suit if they can. And the highest card is going to win. And they're going to take that card in the middle. The other person's going to get a blind draw from the top of the deck. The card that's won, the blind draw, that goes into your deck for the second half of the game. You're going to play through that until you've each claimed a certain number of cards. Then you're going to take that deck you've created. And then you're going to play a straight out trick taker. And whoever claims a hand is going to take the two cards in that hand and add them to their score pile. The end of the game, in the five different suits, five different races, whoever's got the majority of each type is going to score one point, and if you win three suits, three points, you're going to win the game. The twist on that comes in the fact that the five suits do different things. There are lots of goblins. They don't particularly have a power, but any knight will defeat a goblin, no matter what their number is. Dwarfs, when played in the second half... The loser of the hand always takes all the dwarf cards involved in it. So you might want to play low dwarf cards. For the undead, whenever you use undead in the first half of the game, whoever wins the trick takes them immediately and puts them in the pile. So that's the only scoring you can do in that whole first half of the game. And doppelgangers can be played on any suit. And they're what add a lot of the tactics to the game of when you might want to avoid playing a certain card from your hand. Because you have to follow suit, but doppelganger pretty much blocks that i am not the world's biggest trick taker fan tell me that there's a two-player trick taker i'd have to say that that's a hard sell but this one may just have pulled it off sure mm-hmm. i might have my grumpy head on again Vernon. oh dear you you borrowed this come on i borrowed it i played it i didn't really get it we kind of got the the different ways of winning in the second half by obviously knights attacking goblins and trying to play the low dwarfs cards, but it didn't really capture the interest for me, Ronan. And I, I'm not a big trick taker fan. There's maybe probably one or two trick takers that I've ever really thoroughly enjoyed. I didn't mind playing it again. It was one of those, yeah, okay, I can see there's a little bit of cleverness to it, but not for me. I'm not that fussed by trick takers. There are people who absolutely love them and play them again and again and want to get lots of different ones and explore that area, and that's grand and more power to them. I think that this and Fox in the Forest got a lot of positive reaction because they've pulled off that trick of creating a two-player trick-taker. And if you're a trick-taker fan, that is brilliant. And these two do it because you have to have some random somehow to make it a two-player trick-taker. It's perfect information, obviously, is boring. You know exactly what's going on. So I think you have to applaud the design 
you have to pl- I have to applaud the fact that you've made a trick taker that I quite enjoy playing. I don't mind the game of claim. I can see the interest in it. I still just don't like trick takers. So it's one of those reviews where I say, it's not for me. If you like trick takers, definitely go for it because there's a good game there and a good design and they've done it well. I'm just not going to get it out again and again. I would fully concur with that assessment. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, we're going super, super light again. And it's a couple of games, really, but uh, I want to talk about Bugger Loop, which is the follow-on from Bugs in the Kitchen. Now, Bugger Loop was designed again by the brands, which I was quite surprised to find, Ronan, the brands designed this, uh, Marcus and Inca. It's from Ravensburger, two to four players. Uh, Bugs in the Kitchen was uh, Peter Paul Yupin who designed that. So what it is, if, if you know the, the little hex bugs that you can get, you, can, you turn them on, they go around mazes, and they crawl around things. And basically, one of those come in, the box, in both of these boxes. Now, Bugs in the Kitchen was all about, you had four areas, the four corners of the box you had a section of uh, squares made up by forks and spoons and they were on pivots so you could turn them round and basically you could make a maze where to guide the bug into your own corner of the box and if you were able to do this then you would score a point and you do this by rolling a die and then turning one of these things as i said now where bugger loop changes is it's all about the bug disappears under the playing surface as quickly as you can you're trying to get your bugs your little bugs to the far corner of the board and when the bug appears and it's and it's very theatrical he comes up through this see-through tube and you can see him coming up through it and he, when he arrives on the board you've got to stop playing and if he knocks your bug off the spot that it's on, then you've got to take it back. It goes all the way back to the beginning. If he doesn't and goes back down under the board, you carry on playing. So it's really an efficiency and speed going as quickly as you can to try and get your bugs. And there's also places that they can hide away from the bug on the board. So that's the two games, Ronan. Have you had any experience with them? I have not. My kids were never interested in hex bugs. I don't know why. But to me, it sounds... Like, it might be a cross between a toy and a game. More game or more toy? Bugs in the Kitchen, I would err on the side of game. And Bugger Loop, I would say it's more a toy. Okay. Yeah, I think that kind of gives away my feelings for the for the two. I quite enjoyed Bugs in the Kitchen, because there was that element where you were up against everyone else. Everyone had their own agenda. You were trying to sort of... Uh, eat that bug round the maze towards you without being too obvious and be out setting yourself up for pitfalls and giving people easy blocks to block you in and make sure that they the bug came over to their side of the board with bug loop it's just as i said it's just speed and surprise is all you really get in the game you're rolling as fast as you can to try and get your bugs over to the far side of the board and when the bug comes up it's a surprise and then everyone stops and then it's the lap of the gods, whether it knocks your counter or not. So, yeah, I'd say that one more of a toy, Bugs in the Kitchen. Did, did James get very excited, though, with this whole thing, with the insect coming? And uh, Did he enjoy the novelty of it? I think you need some game for it to be sort of a long term here. For a couple of games, did he really enjoy it, or was it not even doing that? No, 100%. No, he loved it. He loved it. You could hear the bugs scuttling around to the bottom of the board. It's quite creepy, really. And all of a sudden, he's very clever. He appears, and you can see him working his way up the tube, and you know you've maybe got two dice rolls before he gets out of the tube onto the board, so you're trying to get maybe your bug to safety. So there is that excitement factor, but I think that quickly died down, and he went back to bugs in the kitchen. Fair enough. We are going to look at another Inca and Marcus brand game, Sean. It's like, it's like their episode this time around. It is, it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is Rajas of the Ganges, a 2017 release, about 60 minutes long for two to four players from Hook and R&R Games. 
Rise of the Ganges is a worker placement game in which you're placing workers on the board. Usually it's going to cost you money and or some dice, which are a resource in the game. And you're attempting to do this in order to build up your own area. It's themed around an Indian estate in, in India. And you're going to create roads that you need to link together. You can make them go off the edge of your estate to get bonuses. You, you have markets on these tiles. You have different types of buildings on these tiles. And the buildings will score you victory points. And the markets will give you a chance to earn money. Money. And there's two tracks that go around the board, the money one and the victory point one. And if you ever cross your markers across, then you've won the game, basically. The first person to earn enough money and enough victory points for them to go, because they go clockwise and anti-clockwise. On the board itself, where you're going to place, you're going to activate markets on your board, either lots of different ones or lots of the same, depending upon if you spend dice. You're going to be looking to advance your figure along a river. Every stop that you make along there is going to give you some bonuses. But by using a higher level dice, you're going to go further along and get better bonuses quicker. You get extra workers by going far along the river or getting your, your victory point marker along. And you can increase your pool of workers to make you more efficient and speed up on this race all the way along. You can activate personalities in the palace, which will give you certain bonuses and, and help you along your way. And all the way, you're trying to basically create an engine of scoring victory points or money or both. This got a fair amount of buzz pre S and Sean. Because it's from Inca and Marcus Brand, I think we've, especially in this in this episode, you might see we've got a bit of a skewed view on them. And we see them as hobby gamers when probably they're much more family gamers. And I fell into that trap of expectations with Rise of the Ganges and I thought this was going to be a medium weight, thinky economy euro. Again, I'm sort of sitting on the fence boy here. I quite enjoyed it, but I think there was two fundamental problems for me with Rajas of the Ganges. You've touched on one of them in that, yeah, I thought it was going to be a bit deeper than it than it turned out to be. It didn't really hit that sort of medium weight Euro feel that I thought I was going to get from it. Now the second one, I felt that there was this illusion that you were going to have lots of paths to victory because of the two obviously victory tracks that are going round clockwise and anti-clockwise the various things you can do with the dice and there's lots of things you can do but there's one thing in the game that i found if you do not do you're going to lose the game and then they even go as far as to put that in the rule book is to say if you do not build your markets and get and harvest from those markets and trade you're not going to win the game the money marker i found way easier to move around the track than the vp marker absolutely yeah. Uh, i saw maybe once in the games i played where someone got their vp marker more than halfway round, and the other 90 percent of the time the money marker was the one that was coming all the way around almost to the point where people needed a handful of victory points to be able to win the game, like six victory points and a hundred money. <laughs> Put it that way. And each money is worth uh, two money to one VP, so that shows you the imbalance in there. The fact that it was much lighter and looser, to me, was another bit of a problem. But I think it goes back to something that I said earlier in the first half, that it's a different market in Germany. And this might be seen as a family game over there. Because all the family will be used to Euro mechanisms and they'd understand resource management and they'd understand tar laying. And so therefore, we play it with the family and the, the looseness and the lightness while still having to think about Euro mechanisms is OK for that market. Whereas for me, I wasn't getting enough output for my input. My brain was trying to play a proper Euro game. But what I was getting back out was just doing the same thing again and again and rinse the market, rinse the market, rinse the market, make money, make money, make money. And it wasn't very satisfying. After three plays, I was done with Rise of the Ganges, to be honest with you. If I was to play again, I'd have to start house ruling, which, you know, people people don't like us to talk about house rules. They don't like to mess with the game. The game is the game as presented. I would play four players on the two player side of the map to make it much tighter for spaces. And there are these sort of extra bonus markers that come that you don't use in the base game. Every time you build a building, which is the main way of generating victory points, and you can build up your own victory points per building, 
But every time we build one, I would give you a bonus marker as well to make that a worthwhile strategy and something worth pursuing to put a bit more interest in there rather than who's got to the marketplaces first this round. OK, now everyone's going to tit around for the rest of the round doing bits and bobs. OK, who's got to the marketplaces first this round? Because that's what I found in all my games. Yeah, I think there's also that that space on the market to track where it doesn't cost you a die and that's quite powerful. I'd, I'd eradicate that. I'd say that one would always cost you a die. But I think I've reached the mindset of Roger does Ganges. I actually really enjoy playing it if I don't think, you know what, I have to rinse the market. That's going to probably mean I'm going to lose the game. So I have to be all right with losing the game or playing with somebody who wants to try all the different things themselves. Because I really enjoy playing the, the manipulation of the dice and getting the different dice into your hands and, and working up the river and different things that you can do in the game. That market is almost, to everybody else, has just completely ruined that side of the game because they're not really concentrating. They're not exploring that side because the market is so powerful. So that's the way I think I need to enjoy this game because I do enjoy it. But yeah, the market was a little bit overpowered for me. So you're talking about play suboptimally or house rule it or yeah. say the money track cuts halfway round, so you've got to get your VP a certain length or you can't. You know, we're talking about butchering a game where it's still getting loads of buzz. And I'm still seeing it on what do you play this week geek list and people going, I Ooh. love it. Best yeah. game of 2017. I have so much fun. It's I, I didn't see that game. So other opinions exist by all means of Rogers of the Ganges, but for myself, for people I played it with, Sean, we, it was, mm, no, it didn't hit, I'm afraid. Sean, lead us on to a dream home. <laughs> yes, a dream home indeed. From Clemens Kalicki, coming from Rebel Games, and two to four players. Now, we have already talked about this game twice in the, on the game pit already. I hadn't played it up to now, so I'm just going to really quickly touch on the two-player version of this game, which, contrary to everything that's come before, which we've always been quite positive about it, and I think it is a really good game. Let me just start that from the very start. But I do not think it scales for two players, Ronan. The You're just a negative Nelly. You're trying to I play am a draft negative game. Nelly. Drafting game for two players. Of course it doesn't work well. Come on. It had to be designed specifically for two players. Yeah. Go back to Seven Wonders Duel or that app, Age of Rivals. Designed for two players. Dream Home, not designed for two no, players. No, no. It's it one of those ones where the player count should have started at three. A hundred percent. What they've done is they've... The rules for the two-player game, the first player will take one card and discard one card. So it's like, I really want that. You really want that. Bing, I'll take that so powerful so all you're doing is fighting for first player all the time which elongates the game because you're only taking the first player card all the time and you're not getting the two cards into your hand so it kind of dragged the game out you're still left with a nice dream home at the end of it perfectly pleasant game can see it working really well three and four players absolutely maybe not enough in it for me personally i'd be happy to play it though ronan but i don't think we need to say much more than more than that about dream home no, I'll just reiterate what myself and Eleanor said when she was on a few episodes ago. We liked it a lot. She thought it was a little bit too young even for her at 14. So maybe 7 to 12-year-old range. Great theme. Really good game. Really good expansion. For a family game, I think this is very, very strong for three or more players. Cool. What's you got next, Roland? Well, you've talked about your dream home. In my next game... Your dream home has been destroyed by a bombing raid and you're looking to survive in the ruins. How does that sound? Yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like a, a, a dream double double night of gaming. Yeah, I think some some of the things that happen in this game are going to stretch the family market appeal. <laughs> uh, like I said, but, you know, family can mean cousins, aunts, uncles. <laughs> family for you is young. Family for other people is not, you know. We've got broaden horizons a little, man. Come on, we're good. Raid and Tai Hoku. 2017 game, 50 minutes long, two to four players from Mizo, which is part of Taiwan board game design and designed by Teng. Che Ming, you are up to four members out of eight of a family 
in Taihoku or Taipei, Taiwan, during a US Air Force bombing raid in May 1945, and your house has been bombed. You have now got a set number of rounds in which you need to survive during this raid that's going on and get to the end, and that's how you're going to win during this co-op. You've all got stats for how hungry you are, how healthy you are, your stamina, and what your mood is. And if any of those reach zero for any player, it's game over. What you're doing during each round is taking actions, the number of actions equal to the number of your stamina, to scavenge food, to try and find items, dig through rubble, get medicine, and survive the air raids that come along at the end of every round. And they drop bombs on various areas, five areas at a time across this board, which represents the city. And if you're caught by one of those bombs, you're going to suffer some damage to your health. As well as that, Each of those eight family members have got three different stories, three different entanglements they can be involved in. And they have to deal with those entanglements before you get about two thirds of the way through the game or it's going to have a serious negative impact on them, on their mood and put them at huge risk of dying. There's also an event deck. An event deck randomly will happen each turn, which will add some spice to the situation. Tell you you must go somewhere to survive this round or you must avoid the marauding gangs or maybe female members can't be left alone or you lose a certain amount of food. Whoever it might be, it's going to mix it up. And can you survive? Are you going to make choices to go to the local shrines in order to, to get a little bit more mood and health, but maybe it might get bombed more often? Are you going to get so hungry you're going to have to eat the family pets? And it does touch on some of those darker themes, which I mentioned this in relation to this War of Mine in the 10 by 10 episode last time, because it touches, brushes lightly on some of the similar themes in there. It's not at all as in-depth. It's not at all take them on with what's going to make you as emotional but the theme is there and it is definitely mentioned that this is not a good time for this family and you really are just trying to survive sean you've had a sniff at raiden taihoku i have ronan i have and first off it's a beautiful game really it kind of evokes that sort of feeling you've got the rubble the house rubble you've got the metal air raid tokens and you've obviously got the story behind the, each of the characters, and it kind of yeah, it kind of evokes what was going on at the time. Yeah, and that, those stories, those entanglements, really help to shape the first half of the game. I think they're really vital because, in general, you just be wandering around, stockpiling food, stockpiling medicine, stockpiling items. There's a limit to how much each person can carry, and that's hugely important because you really will get stuck. And the entanglements a part of that as well because they say you have to go and do this the elder sister you have to go and get your fiance from the heavily bombed docks and try and get into the hospital the father your job is to go around and collect these relics the grandfather might always be worried about the family home he always has to be near the family home because he's trying to look after it maybe the older brother who's joined the army maybe he's got a secret mission he's got to go and retrieve documents and get them somewhere and they will take up part of your capacity and you have to get them done and that like I say, shapes the first half of the game, Sean. It gives you something to do beyond just surviving, which is what really happens in the final third of the game. It's a puzzle. There's a tiny bit of economy in there, but makes it mostly it's a puzzle, but you bring some really, really real and strong themes in with those event cards, right? And I think that's what drives drives the game on and makes you just keep on your toes, because towards the end you are kind of just itching around in a lower player count game yeah it's a good point i think it certainly works best with four it's easier with fewer than four players you end up with more stuff really than you need because it doesn't change the amount of stuff in the game the events and the air raids which are random you might find out where they are via a certain item but uh, an air raid leaflet but it mixes it up and you are always on your toes and even towards the end certain events can hit you quite hard and with four players you're enough on the line that it matters what the events are with fewer you can get to the last two or three rounds and be fairly confident you're going to survive and it takes away the edge of that because it's quite like mechanisms of the game but it's quite a heavy theme and you need that sense of peril to really work with that theme I did feel it, it was just yeah, that last round or two, once we managed to get enough medicine so that we couldn't actually be killed off by the bombing raids. I think, yeah, maybe they fell a little bit flat. Yeah, that could not happen. Maybe that was that we played quite well and got the right things at the right time. So, yeah, I think it could have worked for three, but I think it's more likely to work for four. But I thoroughly enjoyed my game of it, and yeah, 
I was quite surprised when some of those themes came out. Uh, it's such a nice presentation. It looks like a family game, but maybe you don't expect it to bite you quite so hard. It's it's a new theme. It's obviously a bit of history that I wouldn't say I was any expert in. It's nice to get perspectives from different parts of the world telling stories. I, I love history anyway. I love a story. Uh, it's got very familiar mechanisms, but it's certainly worth playing as a way to exp- to explore this sort of story and this sort of peril. And they are looking for publishing partners. So if you know a publisher, if you are a publisher, if you're interested, have a look at Raiden Taioku. There is a pit stop, plug, 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 and uh, and get in contact with Tyrone Board Game Design or, or Mizo because they're looking to spread it around the world because it's getting buzz. It's a very small release. It's hard to get in Europe, but slowly the buzz is building for Raiden Taioku. Very, very good. Now, onto something where the buzz was absolutely huge when it came out. And it's kind of the theme of this show is expectation of games, the meeting them or not quite meeting them. You can't have had high expectations for this. Come on. When it first came out, I had no expectations for it. Okay. Okay. Then, what is it, by the way? <laughs> so yeah, yeah, we should really say that. It's yeah. Monopoly Gamer. I have no idea who designed it, but it's for two to four players. <laughs> Monopoly Man did. What's wrong Monopoly with Monopoly Man, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then people like Tom Vassell were coming out and saying, yeah, I've bought it, and it's actually a lot of fun, and I'm giving it positive reviews. I'm like, Monopoly. But the gaming community usually frowns on Monopoly. So you know what? I gave it a go. I bought it for the boy and we played it. And I didn't like it, Ronan. I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked. You're not shocked. It was too long. It was frustrating. It was really mean. So what they've done is they've turned Monopoly and added sort of Mario carts to it. So you've got the Mario characters, or at least four of them, going round and they're basically shooting at each other or doing things to make everyone else drop money on the board and the people are hoovering it up and yeah so when my five-year-old sort of gathers a load of money he thinks he's doing well and i i land on a space and i play my special power and it's like well yeah you've got to drop half that money sorry yeah you would do that yeah yeah i would do it <laughs> well, it's very prescriptive it's like the next player in front of you so if that happens to be him He's got to drop the money. And there's one power overpowered. Yoshi, who we always make the boy take because it is overpowered. He hoovers up every all the money on the on the on the board if he gets his go. So if he gets his special power. And yeah. It made Monopoly worse for me. Whoa. I was gonna ask you if there's any narrative. How was the randomness? Was it any good? Worse than Monopoly. I, we we can finish there, Sean. We can finish though, I don't mind. You you're going around, you're buying you're buying things and eventually if you if you're the first to pass go, or when you pass go you get to challenge a monster and you can fight them and you can roll a dice to fight this monster or like one of the big baddies and yeah, you might do it, the next person after you might do it. <laughs> yeah. I, I tell you what, I I much preferred I bought him Monopoly Junior. He loves it. I'm not fast, but <laughs> He loves it. He he sees it. It's not as nasty. And yeah, you still land on people's stuff and have to pay them, but he understands that. It's like, but why do I drop all that money? Well, I landed on a star, so that means I shoot you because you're the next one. And it's he doesn't understand that. It's like, but that's mean. Why did you shoot me, Daddy? <laughs> Monopoly he gets. Wow. Worse than Monopoly. Mm. That's really we've got two right. games here to turn this round short because that's a bit of a. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've got my grumpy head on now, Ronan. That's not going to change. Oh dear! Oh. Right, let's see if I can pull you out with my last game. Go on, let's do it. Space, space race, the card game. Everyone likes the space race, Sean. It's got Elon Musk. Yeah, come on. 2017, one to four players, 60 minutes. Does the publisher is Board Cubator, and the designers are Marek Loscott and Jan Sukel. In this, you're going to be creating a space agency. You're nominally are uh, Russians or Europe or private enterprise or America, but you're not really. You're just creating a space agency from a whole deck of cards. You'll be doing this by drafting cards. On a turn, each player's got a bunch of activation cards, a little bit akin to Race for the Galaxy. And you're going to choose one of your activation cards. You've got three for each of four different phases. And when you play that card, you activate that phase for yourself only. And there are four phases that can go. And whoever's activated the first phase goes, okay, go. You do your things. On your turn, 
if you've activated a certain colour, let's say you activate the purple colour, the purple face, there are cards on the board available to be drafted in a place called the universe. You take any of the purple cards and you put them into your agency and then any purple powers that are on cards will activate. Now, it doesn't mean that they'll necessarily be on purple cards. There can be cards you place before of yellow, blue or red. They all have names, but it gets confusing when I start calling them technology phase and stuff like that. So let's just stick to colors. All your purple colors activate. What you're attempting to do is every card that you get into your space agency is going to score you points in some way. Obviously, you're attempting to build up this tableau of powers and then activate them efficiently. The way you manipulate this, the way you do this is that cards can be in four places. They can be in the universe. They get to the universe from your hand. And that happens at the end of a round. You choose cards from your hand that you're going to put into the universe to make available. And then from the universe, they can go into your agency or this lab. And from the lab, they might get across to your agency. And there's a funny card cycling where when you draw a card, there's very few ways to get that from your hand directly into your agency. You have to put it on offer, which means it might get taken by someone else, and then get it into your universe, and then possibly activate a third phase in order to trigger it off. And it's only seven rounds of the game. What you have to do is very quickly get a plan in place and trigger it off and roll off the back of the things that you've done previously to create synergies through cards. And all the cards are based on real life things. So they're real spacecraft or real mission directors or Richard Branson's there or there's famous astronauts or there's famous scientists, whatever it, it might be. It's quite hard to explain because it is not necessarily an intuitive system of rolling through where you don't draw cards and play them you draw cards offer them choose the right phase to draft them to put them in they might not activate on the phase of their color you might have to in the next round activate a different phase to activate the power that's on the card which is the whole reason you wanted it three goes ago to now execute your plan but you only have seven rounds to do this how did i make that sound sean you made it sound really interesting i really want to give it a go ronan couple of questions how quickly does it play you did mention and i say an hour three to four player it's an hour long game cool and does it evoke the space race to you do you feel like you're in the space race or is it just purely abstract what the first few plays you're so busy trying to work out this puzzle that you've got it's slightly interactive. There are cards that let you spy on each other and steal each other's tech out of labs. And there are score conditions. There are red cards which go down the bottom. They never have powers on them. But for having majorities of symbols there, you can get quite a lot of points. So you are looking at what other people are doing. And you're so busy solving that puzzle that's changing and changes every time you draw cards. You look at them going, oh, okay, I want that in the universe this time and this in the universe next time. But do I have the right phase cards because when you activate a phase you spent that phase card and you only have three of each color so you can get yourself like oh do i want to activate purple now it's my last purple card so you're so busy solving that puzzle that the theme it certainly ties it together it's good to see cards that you recognize because you you would say oh neil armstrong does this oh okay the, the satellite station in what yeah radar station such such does that or my rocket preapa 246 does that the cards and everything ties it together, helps you make sense of what you're doing. Do I feel like I'm building a space agency? Not really, because it's not very epic, because it's only seven rounds. So I don't feel like I'm going on this huge journey of development and tech, and, and it doesn't work in a chronological way like that. You know, it's not like I'm recruiting scientists to do research, to develop a ship, to send it off, like you get in Solaris Mission or for Ivan 2 or whatever like that. It's very much more a rolling thing where you're putting things in different places and by the end you're running it going, okay, does this synergy work? Cool. Well, what that, that sounds like a really a deeper game than I was expecting from from this card game and very, very much a game that you can sort of get your teeth into, maybe play up multiple times. Would you think there's different avenues to victory or have you kind of found that optimum route already? Dude, I don't think there's any way of finding an op optimum route because you don't know what you're going to get. It's a big enough deck that you're not going to get the same cards from game to game to game. There's only usually two copies of each card. You've got over 100 cards in there. So it is a lot more a puzzle that you're trying to solve in the first couple of rounds, and then you react to what else comes up. 
So, no, I don't think there's an optimal route to victory. There's too much variation. Someone might put a card on offer that you weren't expecting that might make you shift mid-game. I refer back to Race of Galaxy. It's not that similar to it, but it has got some similarities. And I think it's the one sort of lodestone that I'll try and pull it towards. But, you know, in Race of Galaxy, you might go, right, I'm going mining this time. And then you keep pulling military cards. You go, oh, well, I'm just going military. <laughs> That's it. That can happen in Space Race as well. And it... And it Again, another similarity to Race of Galaxy, there are various strategies you can go down, and the strategy you have to go for is affected by what cards you see. Same in Space Race again. So that's more what it's like, mate. Ronan, I'm in. I'm in. I'm definitely in for this one. It sounds really interesting. It sounds right up my street, sort of constantly working with what you've got, constantly on your toes. I like the sound of this one. It's broken okay. me out of my, my misery <laughs> for a I'll brief while. So. Space race the car game. It needs getting used to. I'm not sure it's set up to have the best first impression. And you'll play it and you'll go, oh, God, I played that absolutely terribly. And you'll either want to play it again or you won't. And if you do, it's a challenge that you want to take on. Of all the games in this episode, it certainly has the most promise for depth and for continued play and for getting used to the mechanisms and for getting over that hurdle and really getting to know the deck and what's there. They kickstarted an expansion recently. It is rowing somewhere for board cubator. It's growing some some legs and, and some momentum, and I hope it does. I hope it gets to a wider audience because I think there's a lot here to explore. I don't have a set final opinion on it because I'd need to work out whether I'm just so intrigued by the mechanisms that it's it's just the mechanisms that's got my brain whirring. Once I get past that, is there enough of a game? I think there is. It might be something we revisit, but it's definitely something I think that's worth having a look at. So I'm going to finish on a high, and the most promise of any game here is definitely Space Race, the card game. Sean, are you going to finish on a high number? Not particularly. <laughs> you kind of spoiled that a little bit, mate. Know, we guessed that. I, I was trying to drag you out of it. Come on, then. No. I think what we've got in this game, and the game is Numeracy Legends, and it's designed by Chu Lan Kao and Chi Wei Lin, and it comes from a company called Shepherd Kit Incorporated, and it plays one to four players. Well, there's, there's actually three games here. So the ones I've played are the Rainbow Unicorn and the Zerda Fox. Now, what they are is they are built as very much aids for learning for children within the framework of a game. So they're learning different skills, and they, they tell you in each box, like, they're going to be learning this skill and that skill, whether it's sort of just simple, like, addition or gather, like, root, learning how to build roots or go along roots and prioritize things, that kind of thing. I'll talk a bit more about the Rainbow Unicorn because that's the one I've played the most. You're going around, you're gathering resources of certain types and you're built, going along paths and you have to work your way back once you've got different types of resource. And that's the basic game. And you can add certain things in, like you can give your character a power that they can use once off and, and various things in. And they're very, very simple and they're very, very geared towards the education. Now... Sorry, Ron, I'll let you come in before I, I talk more about them. Have you heard about these? Have you got any opinions of them? Not until you put it on the list. I had a look. I saw the sort of Japanese-themed aesthetic that you never usually go for in games. I read they were sort of like puzzles, and I was just... My first question is, how, how did you get into these? What was... How? Okay, so uh, Suzanne on the Dice Tower had mentioned them. She said the her kids really enjoyed them. They were on a Kickstarter. So I looked at the Kickstarter, I read read all the blurb and it it did sound like an interesting way for my son to learn about various different things. And yeah, so I thought I'd give them a go. It was sort of like seventy pounds all in for the three Seventy pounds. Yeah, for the three games. It's three big board games. And are they big board games or are they big puzzles? Um, I would say they're big educational packs that aren't that interesting. <laughs> I'll go back to seventy pounds. Yeah, yeah. You didn't go for like that. I'll, I'll pay twenty pound and just give it a try. No? <laughs> That's why you should have. You know me with Kickstarter. I get carried I, away. I think I do. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. So, have you backed me U boot yet? No, that's your job. That's why I told so, you about it. I think it. I said it was your job. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> so. It feels more like an exercise than a game. 
I know they kind of build it as such, but it really felt like it was more about the education than the game. All of the things that it's teaching my son or is trying to get him to learn, I think he's gleaned from other games that are much more fun, and they are games that also have a learning element in them because of just the way they're played. Like we talked about him having to learn to sort of block people in in bugs in the kitchen and that sort of bit deception and bluffing that kind of thing in enchanted tower and I've, whenever i talk about games for him i always talk about the stuff that he's learned from that game and i think he's learned everything so far that these games have presented but in, in a more fun way it's a very sterile kind of game even though it's very beautiful like the artwork is gorgeous the boards are gorgeous and it looks like amazing on the table it just feels sterile once you get into it. It's very prescriptive, Ronan. What can I say? I have no idea what drew you to it, other than that you just love that back button on Kickstarter. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm shocked that this education tool turned out to be an education tool. <laughs> yeah, but not a particularly good one. I do okay. But now, there we go. Before we go anywhere, I need to haul you to task. Oh, here we go. All right, this second half of this episode, the last four games you've given us was Bugger Loop, don't like it, Dream Home, don't like the two-player version, Monopoly Gamer, don't like it, and Numeracy, don't like it. I need three things that you are positive about in gaming today, right now. Go on, hit me, cheer me up. Positive about gaming? <laughs> yeah, you're excited about it. something you played, something that's coming up. Give me three happy things. Don't throw these the things at me. You know, yes. you know we're going to fight I'm throwing later. it. We're going to go fight on later. Go on, what you okay. played that's been good? What are you excited about? What do you want to play? Ronan. Talk to me. Yes. We're going to review it. We had a very funny game of Mythic Battles yesterday, didn't we? We were terrible. We were terrible at Mythic You've Battles. never seen <laughs> such an inept battle of any in any game ever. <laughs> what? Can I? Oh, I haven't done that. Oh, what, what? What? I've left all my figures there for you to petrify at once. Oh, God. And you didn't quite kill the Minotaur, so you couldn't move anyone out. <laughs> I'd spent all their cars anyway, most of them. And oh, I, we uh, played so bad, but it was so much fun. The best bit was Ronan realising after I'd killed his god that every time I'd killed one of his previous characters, he should have been healing all the time. And yours! And, and, and when anyone dies on the thing, I had Hades. Heals. Every time someone dies, he heals. And I had Sean just beating me up, and I, was, I didn't use it at all. Ah, oh, that was brilliant. I intend for us to get a bit better at it before we review it. But it was at least equal levels of incompetence. That's one. Go on, two more things to cheer me up. I I backed Western Legends on Kickstarter, which I'm really excited. I know you're not. I know you're not that fussed by it, but I... We're not talking about negative things, just okay. all positive. Come positive, on. I've backed Western Legends, and I think it's going to be a fantastic... I'm excited to either play a really good game or abuse you for wasting money on Kickstarter, delete is applicable, and number okay. three, okay. cheer me just, and just, up. Just before we go, yeah. don't mention something that you've just backed on Kickstarter when you're sitting next to your wife. <laughs> There's a little tip for everyone. <laughs> Good work. I've just Third got the, thing, I've just got the evil eyeball. Okay, and <laughs> lastly, Ronan, I've just got shipping notice for Lords of Hellas. Oh, I haven't got my shipping notice yet. <laughs> <gasps> so excited. But Hunt for the Ring did turn up today. Uh, have, I was you, actually have, you, it. have you stopped hugging it yet? I'm hugging it and licking it and petting it. Oh, I love him and pet him and call him George. <laughs> well, I, I hope that that three minutes of positivity went some way to balance the previous 20 minutes of misery from you. <laughs> ah, listen, not every family game or children's game is going to be good. True. You were... At least honest. Anyway, should we take these poor people to the outro? Let's do that. Okay, there we go. That is a rake of games talked about. Yeah, I apologise. I was a bit stroppy on some of them, but I was keeping it real, Ronan. 
I like it, Sean. There's, there's a kickback against over positivity in gaming. The fact is, we all like games, but they're not all great. Sometimes you just have to let it out. It's all right. Do you feel better for it? <sighs> so what's what's coming up for us, Ronan? Again, we are off to Aircon, aren't we? On the 9th to the 11th of March. We are, and we, I think we might be appearing on the Polyhedron Collider soon after that from Aircon. But it also looks like there's about 40 podcasters signed up for that recording. So whether we get on it or not, who knows? But but our name's there. Aircon have emailed out about it. We were, um, we're there in the list about 19th or 20th, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud of that. Don't you worry about that. That was all good. Uh, so, yeah, Aircon's coming up, as, as we've been saying all the way through. Listen to our 10 by 10 episode last time around. Uh, and any of those games you want to play with us, please do let us know. Grab us when we're there. We have got reviews coming up next time around for Civilization and New Dawn, Empires of the Void 2, Reworld, Fallout, Tulip Bubble, and a Column of Fire. And hot on the heels of that, I believe, Sean, is going to be our episode 100. Yeah, finally. That you've been planning for five, six years now. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so, as Rhoda said, mid-episode, please, if you do have any questions that you want us to answer on the on the show, whether it be just general questions about how we do things or games that you particularly want us to talk about, old reviews, new reviews, whatever you want, you tell us, we'll do it. Just email us on the game pit podcast at gmail.com. Beautiful, Sean. It's been a wonderful experience. Indeed, Roland. It's been emotional. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will see you in, hopefully, not too long with those six reviews. And Sean is going to see us out. We'll catch you next time on The Game Pit. Yes, as always, we are proud members of the Dice Tower Network. Go there and to the Dice Tower itself for gaming goodness galore. If you wish to email us, as I just said, we are at thegamepitpodcast at gmail.com. We're on social media as well. We have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, and we're on Twitter at Game Pit Podcast. One of the best places to hunt us down and begin a chat or ask us some questions is on our Board Game Geek Guild, so pop along there. If you wish to download the episodes, we're on Podbean, Stitcher, and iTunes. And we do have our YouTube channel where we are doing pit stop videos. Pit stop videos are a very short and quick overview of various board games. Thank you very much for listening. And we'll see you again. Music by E. Aaron. Boy, 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 bo